Okay, so we're gonna learn a little bit about Mexico and talk about it. And I got a couple things I wanna share with you guys, but if you have any questions, uh, I wanna leave some time at the end so you guys can ask your questions. So Mexico is a country, uh, first I'm gonna talk about some of the, the things that are similar between Mexico and the States, the United States, uh, so you can understand how there's a lot of similarities, but then talk about some of the differences. So the system of government is very similar uh, Mexico is a, is a democracy. There's 32 states in Mexico. There's Mexico's roughly about a third of the, of, of the size and as far as population as the United States. There's about 120 to 130 million people in Mexico. Um, the states, uh, each state has, it has its governor, each state has, has its capital. The form of government is very similar. And both countries, the United States uh, gained its independence in 1776. Uh, and then had a civil war roughly about 100 years later. Mexico became a nation or gained its independence in 1810 and then had a revolution 100 years later, 1910. So, so some things are similar. Uh, we have, a ver si se puede poner el, el que sigue de los estados. Those are the states of Mexico. We're up in the northwest corner, the purple state there, Baja California. Um, and Something that's different between Mexico and the States is that Mexico is a very, very centralized country. The, the size of Mexico City is roughly the size of New York, Chicago put together. Uh, actually more than that, it's about 26 million people, so it's a huge uh, capital city. And Mexico is very, uh, has a lot of bureaucracy, so like a lot of, like if you need a permit or you need the paperwork done, anything important has to go through Mexico City. So those of us that are on the, on the edges of, of Mexico, uh, people from here have to travel to Mexico City to get certain things done. And in the olden days, people you know, had to go on train or had to take horses to get to Mexico City because Mexico has always been about Mexico City. It's, 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 it's a very centralized nation. Uh, that's different than, from the states where Washington DC is the capital, but Washington state is cooler than Washington DC. You know, not, not everything revolves around Washington DC. Uh, but Mexico is not like that. That's, I mean, it's a huge amount of people in Mexico City, and the area around Mexico City is the area uh, most populated in Mexico. As far as the political parties, we have three political uh, political parties in Mexico. Uh, it's easier to learn them by their colors. One is blue, one is red, and one is yellow. Suppose uh, we have the the revolution in Mexico was started because. The president, uh, whose name was Porfirio Diaz, he roughly became president about the same time as Abraham Lincoln, and he reelected himself and reelected himself and, and established a very corrupt government until 1910 that he was finally kicked out of, of office and, and the, the revolution took place. So because of that, uh, one of the strong things in Mexico is that, the, that a president cannot be reelected. So there's no reelection. There's all, all presidents serve one term. Uh, in, in the States, it's a four-year term. In Mexico, it's six years. So 2018 is, a, is an election year. So we're getting ready for elections this year. Um, like I said, there's three, there's three parties. The PRI, or the, the PRI, is the, red, is the red party. And that, that party is the one that has been most in power in the, in the history of Mexico since the revolution. The yellow one, the PRD, is a, is a more of a left uh, a left party, they you know more socialist. They've never been in party, but right now they're according to the polls, they're 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 going to win or they're on track to win. And and the pan, the, the the parties in Mexico aren't as clear cut as in the states of Republican and, and the Democrats. But a little bit, you could say that the the red party, the PRI, is a little bit more like the Democrats. They're like they're supported mostly by un labor unions and big uh, big unions like that. They're more they, that they give away things to the poor, uh, more more like social welfare. And the blue party, the fine is a little bit more like the Republicans. They're a little more in support of of uh, of business and less a little less taxes. But it's not it's not as clear cut uh, in Mexico. Most of most of the time, people vote more on who the candidate is. Instead of the party, they're not like they're not like hardcore for one party as much as in the states. Uh, Mexico is a little bit more socialist than the states. For example, we have 
uh, public health care. So every, every Mexican uh, can go to the doctor essentially for free. It's a terrible service. Uh, you, 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 if, if you need an operation or you need something, literally sometimes you're like to get an operation, you have to wait months or even years before you, it's your turn to get an operation. Um, if, you're, if you have a cold and you go to the doctor, you have to go very early in the morning to get a number and then you wait for, for a few hours until, until one person sees you, then you wait a few hours until another person sees you. So uh, if, if you're able to afford it, most people prefer to go to a private doctor because, because it's, it's very bad uh, and you don't, you don't waste all your time for, for something simple, but, but, it, but everyone has healthcare. It, it is helpful for those who are poor because they can't go to the doctor for free or at a low cost. Uh, Mexico has housing, um, government housing. So when you have a job, part of your paycheck goes to pay for a, ho a house, a very small house, but, but people are, are able to get it through, through government subsidies. So, so there are a lot of, um, it's a little more social welfare than, than in the States. Uh, that's, that's the president of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto. He's from the PRI. Uh, the PRI, like I said, was in power for 70 years. Uh, and then in 2000, the PRI, for the first time, uh, the opposition party, which was the Blue One Pan, win, but the president's name was uh, Fox. And then in 2006, they won again. And in 2012, they lost to the PRI. So uh, Peña Nieto got in in 2012, and he's been president since then. Uh, one thing to understand about Mexico, and one thing that's different than Mexico, is that Mexico is a very corrupt uh, nation. It's, and as far as government, as far as uh, police or judges, there's, there's a lot of corruption. Uh, this is uh, one of the, the main newspapers in the country. And in, in the International Index of Corruption, so another agency tests all the countries of the world, out of 176 nations, Mexico uh, was 123rd. So. 123rd, uh, so 176 being the most corrupt. So there is a lot of corruption. It's, I mean, it's, it's clear, it's established. And if you live in Mexico and if you're Mexican, you just, you, that's just kind of automatic. You kind of know it. In case you're wondering, si puedes poner la que sigue. Here's, here's a list. Uh, number one, the least corrupt nation is Denmark, New Zealand, uh, Finland and number 18 on the list is the United States there as far as corruption and you got to go way down in the list to find Mexico 123 123 along with Paraguay, Sierra Leona, Iran is 131, Kazakhstan, Nepal, Russia, we're better we're better off in Russia. Yeah. <laughs> so that it's different growing up in a in a corrupt country than it is growing up in the states. So I just want to help you understand this a little bit. For example, a few months ago, um, Willie, who was playing the bass up here, the the governor of his state, the state of Veracruz, which is a very uh, populous state and 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 very wealthy. The the governor's name is Javier Duarte, and he he stole more than a billion dollars of public money. And he bought a bunch of properties, luxury properties in different parts of the world. They, they captured him in Central America. He was trying to escape. Um, but, ¿te sorprendió, Willy, que fuera corrupto? Were you surprised that he was corrupt? No. I mean, this is a, an extreme case. But it's pretty much common knowledge that presidents uh, end their term and then, and then they steal a bunch of money or they save up money while they're in the presidency. A lot of public officials are corrupt. A lot, if you want to get things done in Mexico, like you need permits to open a business, or you're, you're in a legal case, uh, usually or many times corruption is the only way to get things done. It's improved. It's, there's not as much corruption as there used to be. There, there used to be, you, you know, you, get, you used to get stopped by the police all the time asking for bribes. That is a lot less than it used to be. So things are getting better. But there's still a lot of corruption. So Mexicans tend to not believe in their government so much. Uh, Mexicans tend to mistrust their government. And when you vote for, for government, you, mo you, you kind of vote for the least worst option instead of really what, you're, what you believe or what you think. But it's just kind of expected that, that 
those in power are gonna are gonna be in power and and, and fend for themselves. So it's kind of tough to understand Mexico. You need to understand part of the history of Mexico. Mexico was is a conquered nation. The Spaniards came here to conquer the conquistadores. The, the leader of the Spaniards was Hernán Cortés on the left there. Hernán Cortés came to pillage the country, pillage the nation, take as much as he could. And, and the Spanish came, and so, so Mexico, uh, the, Mayan, the, the Mayan culture was a little before, but when the Spanish came, the, those in power were the Aztecs, so Hernán Cortés conquered the Aztecs. And, and, and the, the Spanish established their, uh, their power in Mexico for, for a few hundred years until the independence in 1810. But the identity of the Mexican people is an identity of a, of a conquered people. The Spanish came to conquer. Uh, for example, uh, well, about 10% of Mexicans are indigenous. Jose Luis was talking about that yesterday. But roughly about 12 million Mex Mexicans are indigenous. That means there's another language besides Spanish, which is their first language. Most of the Indians, are indigenous people are, are darker skinned. Uh, and then most of Mexico are, are called mestizos, which is a mix between Europeans, or mostly Spanish, and, and indigenous. And you get kind of the light skinned, which is what most Me Mexicans are. And then you have the, the elite class of Mexico is mostly uh, whiter skinned people who are from direct uh, European origin, descent. Um, I'm going to give you an example so we kind of see how this works. I, I have a bank account in Mexico. One day I was at the bank uh, doing something and the teller told me, oh, I want to let you know that you're, you're one of our preferred uh, customers. And I said, cool, thank you. She said, I'm going to give you this little golden card and you don't have to stand in line. You can come to the bank, come right to the teller. You're one of our cool customers. And I thought, man, that's awesome. And I didn't know why she was doing it. I didn't have a lot of money in the bank. I wish I did. I, I didn't know exactly what it was. So I, so I got my little gold card and, and I was a preferred customer at the bank. About two months later, I understood why I was a gold customer. It's because I was born in the States. All foreigners in Mexico are, are preferred customers at the bank. And that just kind of shows you the, the identity. People from the outside are better than us. People from the outside are wealthier. People than, from the outside are better looking. And so when you come into Mexico, you kind of need to understand that that's, kinda, that's part of the national identity. Now, you're American, you're white. It's going to be, you need to understand this week as you go out, uh, people you see in church, people you see there, will look at you being white, being American, and will automatically assume that you're very wealthy, will automatically assume that you're cooler than they are because you're from the States. So, so I want to encourage you this week, go out, make friends, be friendly, because it's hard for a Mexican, a Mexican, for a Mexican to walk up to American and strike up a conversation, that, that person needs to have a whole, a whole, a great self-esteem and, 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 you know, a lot of courage. Most Mexicans will tend to be shy, will tend to will, you know, sit back. So you go out and we, we wanna show the love of Christ. We wanna show that, that Mexicans aren't less. You know, they're a nation that God, that God loves, that God has chosen, and God is working among them. So, so this, is kind of, this is some of the history. We have Hernán Cortés who came to conquer. They came, they killed thousands and thousands of, Mex of, of indigenous people. They raped a lot of women. It was terrible what the conquistadores did. And for centuries, they pillaged. They, they took all the riches of Mexico and sent them to Europe. And, and that's how this country was established. Contrast that with William Bradford, who was the first governor of Massachusetts. The, the, the pilgrims, when they came to, this, to the United States, and a lot of those who established the United States, they came in peace. They came to look for refuge from political persecution. There were Indians in, in the United States, and, and those, the Europeans kind of, you know, they pushed them west, 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 and they established themselves. And, and there were some things that shouldn't have been done that were done. But it's very different than the history of Mexico, where the Europeans came and, and murdered and, and, and took advantage of those here. So uh, William and Bradford came, and they established the colony. They, they established laws. They established order. They wanted to 
to seek God. It was a different identity. And, and a lot of that history has uh, repercussions up to now and up to what's, what's happening now. So Mexico is a diverse nation. It's a nation uh, in, in the middle of different, in the, in the middle of political crisis, in, in the middle of uh, drug cartels. Because of the corruption, drug cartels have a huge stronghold or foothold in, in the nation. They're able to operate because they pay off a lot of, the, a, a lot of those who should be uh, persecuting them. So Mexico has challenges, but in the midst of this, God is moving among, uh, among Mexico. Um, my parents came as missionaries in the, in the 70s, so I grew up in Mexico my whole life. Uh, 20 years, 30 years ago, in a city like Ensenada, there were maybe four or five churches. Churches were mostly women and children, and, and churches had 20 to 30 people. Uh, now there's about 400 churches in Ensenada. There's a thriving church all over Mexico. Churches are growing. God is pouring out his spirit. God, God is uh, moving churches. We have, we have a Bible school here. Uh, we had 50 students last semester. You saw Mauricio and Willie and, and Johnny, all three of them want to be pastors. They want to serve God full time. They're getting ready to go out. So God is doing awesome things. And we want to be a part of what God is doing in Mexico. In, in, in Baja California, we have uh, the opportunity. We're, we're close to the border. Uh, Baja California is not as traditional as other parts of Mexico. In other parts of Mexico, they, if, if a Christian comes to share the gospel, they, they don't let them into the town. They don't want to hear about them. There's persecution. Here, there's a lot of liberty. There's, a lot of, there's an opportunity to share. There's an opportunity to show God's love with those around us. So, so that's a little bit of me about Mexico. I just want to invite you to take advantage of this week, learn about Mexico, uh, observe what's around you, uh, and all of, all of us have an opportunity every day to show God's love, whether it's nailing some nails or fixing a roof or moving rocks over in Sorrillo, or whether it's playing soccer or playing with kids. We're all ambassadors of Christ, and we have the opportunity to share His love. Any questions? about Mexico, about the government, about the church? If, if I know the answer, I will help you. I got one more question. Yeah. So there's been a lot of, I, I, I think I'm right on this, there's been a lot of factories that have been built around the Tijuana area. Yes. And it sounds like they, they're not very well paying jobs. We, we helped some other families last year. Several of the people worked in those factories, and yet they seem like they weren't even getting the Yes, the, the main industry in all of the, the, um, the cities of Mexico next to the border are, are manufacturing jobs. So there's a lot of, like in Tijuana, there's a Sony factory, there's a lot of you know, DVD players, TVs, uh, and just all sorts of, there's a couple hundred factories. The minimum wage in Mexico is very low. Min minimum wage is about uh, 40 to $50 a month. I mean, a week, $40, $50 a week is minimum wage. Uh, so jobs in factories, like just, you know, basic jobs, um, the people who take them are people who didn't, don't have, you know, maybe they, they didn't finish high school or they don't have a lot of education. So one, like if the father works, it's almost impossible to sustain a family with a, a job like that. Usually, families who work uh, who who work in the factories, they will both need to work, and if they both work, they'll have a very basic economy. I mean, they can get by, they can get by, but not very well. That's just the basic jobs. Obviously, you know, the there's supervisors, there's engineers, there's you know, there, there's different levels, and those will get a better paying job. Um, but at the same time, here. In, in the north part of Mexico, there is more opportunity, there's more industry. Part of that is that we're closer to the border, so, so, a lot, so all those factories ship everything to the states. Uh, so there is more work here, and a lot of workers come from southern Mexico because there are more job opportunities here, as opposed to southern Mexico where a lot of, a lot of areas are still based on agriculture or, or raising cattle, those, those type of things which are even less. Um, so 
don't know if I answered your question. Is that a good day? Eli. Okay, so yesterday we kind of talked about the, like, kind of how in the Catholic religion or the Christian religion, they have Mexicans that kind of form this, like, worshiping the dead kind of thing. Uh-huh. And, like, when did that start? Do you know? Yes, the, the strategy of the Catholic Church is uh, to mix like if a Christian missionary goes to a place that's you know pagan, completely non-Christian, the the Christian Protestant strategy is for the pagans to leave their religion and accept the Christian religion. The the Catholic strategy, especially you know when Mexico was established a few hundred years ago, was to, was to find common ground and mix those pagan religions with the Catholic religion. So there's been an acceptance of that. For example, I've been I was in a town up in the mountains called uh, La Mesa del Nayar in Nayarit. And I was happened to be there when there was a, a festival. So this was a, is this an indigenous group. Part of the festival is that they kill a deer and sacrifice it to their gods. They have these weird worship idols up on the mountains. But and they get they have this festival. They all get drunk. And I was there for the festival. And the festival was coming out of the Catholic Church. So the there's a Catholic priest there. So there's a, there's a very clear mix between their pre-Hispanic uh, traditions and the Catholic Church. So and that's kind of that's allowed. So. So worshiping the dead or, or doing the day of the dead is dates back to the pre-Hispanic times, and now it's just mixed with the church. The way most Mexicans will build, most like middle to low class Mexicans will build their house is that they'll go to work and then say they say they earn $40, $50 a week, they'll put $5 aside and buy some bricks with that. And then every week, they, so they kind of go little by little because they, they they can't go to the bank and get a mortgage, you know, $100,000 mortgage to build the whole thing. So, so a lot of those are, are built like that and then for whatever reason, Plans don't go through; they move, so a lot of a lot of them are abandoned halfway through. Uh, that's that's probably what most of them are. Some of them may be deteriorated; they used to be there and, and they left. Or, or I'll say it this way: we call Christians, you know, those we don't call Catholics Christians. That's kind of accepted in Mexico. There's there's a huge um, about ninety percent of Mexico is nominally Catholic. Most of that is tradition. It's not that they're actually going to church. Uh, but so we have a lot of uh, Catholic uh, things we've inherited. There are some good things from that. For example, uh, you walk up to any Mexican in the street. He believes it's in God. He believes God is good. Uh, he there, there's stuff from Catholic. He believes he's a sinner. Um, so there, there's there's basic truths that that the Bible states that most Mexicans agree with. So that's something uh, pos positive from it. But there's also a lot of negative things, like um, you know, it's, it, the Catholic churches. Most people call themselves call themselves Catholic, but don't seek God. They don't read the Bible. It's mostly women and children who go to the Catholic church. So a lot of that inheritance from the Catholic religion goes into the to the to the Christian church, and we struggle, for example, for men to to get on fire for God, to, for men to leave their families, uh, for people to give to give tithes in the church because Catholics are are used to giving like the how do you say the alms? Like just giving a few coins when you go to church. And, and so a lot of that is stuff we inherited from the Catholic Church. And, and, and the works-based salvation. So most Mexicans believe, you know, salvation is if, if I'm good enough at the end, you know, God will, uh, will take me to heaven or maybe I'll go to purgatory for, for some time and then go to heaven. Uh, but there's not an understanding of the grace of God. Okay, one more question, and I'll hand it over to Kirsten. I know, I know there's other things to do. Who, who raised their hand? Yes, we have. Um, here, this this graph right here is is very recent, and this is just for Baja California, so this is very accurate. Um, uh, it was. <laughs> Gracias. So let's let's look at Ensenada. Ensenada is 72.8% uh, Catholic, which is lower than, than most of Mexico. Uh, almost 20% Christian, which is, the, the national average is about 8%, so Ensenada has a higher rate. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses 5.4, Mormons 1.1, and others 1.1 as well. 
Uh, but it is, Mormonism, for example, has, has grown a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, there's Mormon missionaries coming. There's a lot of Mexican church, a lot of Christian churches. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of Christian churches get divided. You go by a lot of Christian churches and they're kind of, you know, not very well built and stuff. You go by the Mormon churches and they're all the same. They have the grass, the basketball court, and they just look so nice. Uh, so there is a lot of a lot of those religions coming in. For example, we have we have a pastor who who trained here at our Bible school. He's down with with a group of, uh, in Jalisco with an indigenous group. And one day, some some Jehovah's Witnesses came to him, and he had no idea what the Jehovah's Witnesses were. He didn't know he was a sect or anything. Hey, we want to talk about the Bible. Oh, come on, preach at my church. Welcome. And 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 for months, they kind of shared the pulpit with the Jehovah's Witnesses until someone else went to we can tell. Someone else went to say, hey, they, they don't believe this and this and that. So, yes, it is a challenge um, for the church. Should we wrap it up? Uh, yeah. Okay, let's wrap it up because I know there's a few things to do. But thanks, guys, for your paying attention. I hope you learned something.